Hello everyone, welcome to Pikeville History Moments, where we talk about the history and heritage of Pikeville, Kentucky and the surrounding area. Today, we're talking about one of the most famous events that took place during the feud between the Hatfields and the McCoys. The New Year's Day Hatfield Raid on Randall McCoy's cabin. One of our earliest videos was about the hanging of Ellison cotton top mounts for the murder of Alifair McCoy. Well, that crime, whether it was cotton top who took the fatal shot or not, was committed during this raid. And in this video, we're going to tell the story of what is thought to have happened on that night. The feud had been mostly dormant for five years until August of 1887, when Simon Buckner became governor of Kentucky with the reported backing of state representative Perry Klein. The new governor almost immediately sent a request for Governor Wilson in West Virginia to extradite Hatfield allies under indictment for vigilante justice inflicted on three sons of Randall and Sally McCoy. Their execution had been in response to them murdering Ellison Hatfield, the brother of Devil Ants. On December 12th, Bad Frank Phillips, who had been made a special deputy sheriff with a posse of somewhere between 20 and 40 men, went into West Virginia on the first of many illegal raids. The pressure of Devil Ants and his inner circle continued to build. Their desperation even resulted in trying to bribe Perry Klein. It's in this environment that the raid was planned. Some writers argue that the raid was Devil Ants' plan, some that it was Cap's idea, and some even argue that it was a spur-of-the-moment decision following a drunken New Year's Eve party. The purpose of the raid is also in dispute. Some say it was to eliminate witnesses against those involved in the McCoy brothers' deaths, and some that it was simply to kill Randall McCoy. The traditional story of that night goes something like this. It is said that Devil Ants declined to take part at the last minute due to illness, and that he put Jim Vance in charge. Jim Vance and Cap Hatfield led a total of nine men, among them were two of Devil Ants' older sons, Johnsy and Bob, and his nephew, Elliot Hatfield, along with Tom Chambers, Charles Gillespie, Doc Ellis, and Ellison Cottontop Mounts, who was the 24-year-old son of the murdered Ellison Hatfield. The timing of the raid is somewhat in question. It has been variously reported as either shortly after midnight in the earliest hours of January 1st or late that evening. In either case, it was well after dark, under a mostly full moon with near freezing temperatures. Shortly after midnight in the early hours of January 1st, this group of men crossed the tug on horseback but left their horses about a mile from the McCoy cabin. From there, they walked. Jim Vance is said to have threatened to kill any man who shot before he gave the order. When they arrived at the cabin, they quietly surrounded it and several of the men were wearing masks. The two-story cabin sat in a small valley with wooded slopes on either side. It had a detached kitchen connected to the main house by a covered walkway. Of course, there was no electricity at the time, so the house was dark with the family asleep inside. Randall and Sally had a grandson, Melvin, staying with them that night. And in Johnsy's trial, he testified that the silence was broken when a man's voice called out to Randall, come out and surrender as a prisoner of war. It was Calvin, age 25, who woke, quickly dressed, warned his parents, and returned to the second floor, Winchester rifle in hand. Randall took up a position on the first floor with a shotgun. The plane quickly fell apart. Johnsy, ignoring Vance's earlier warning and possibly drunk, fired into the log house. More shots came from the Hatfield side. Calvin and Randolph then responded in kind. It is reported that Johnsy was the first hit with birdshot in the shoulder, likely from Randall's shotgun. 
Tom Chambers was supposed to have had three fingers shot off his hand while he attempted to set fire to the cabin. But Jim Vance then succeeded in starting a blaze. The McCoy women quickly used all the water readily available and even turned buttermilk to try to put out the fire, but it continued to spread. In desperation, Alifair opened the door and is said to have called out to Cap Hatfield that she recognized his voice. When she began to run, presumably for the well, both Cap and Johnsy called out to Ellison Cottontop Mounts to shoot her, and he did. She was the 30-year-old disabled daughter of the McCoys. Fanny McCoy, who was about 14 at the time, said later it was Cap that had shot Alifair, and some feud writers believe this, which would make Mounts into a scapegoat. And that could be true, but the other witnesses who said one way or the other indicated that it was Mounts, as did the illiterate Mounts when he dictated his confession while in custody. Some question that confession, but it's worth pointing out that he never disputed it right up until his execution. When Alifair fell, the girls began to scream, alerting both Calvin and Sally to the trouble. Sally tried to run to her daughter, but was knocked to the ground. She tried to crawl, but she was clubbed in the back of the head, fracturing her skull and rendering her unconscious. Tradition holds that it was Jim Vance. Sally did testify later that she thought Jim Vance was there, but also that she didn't see who clubbed her. In a newspaper interview, Charles Gillespie said it was Ellison Mounts, but in Cotton Top's confession, he identified Johnsy as the culprit. At any rate, it is likely that Calvin and Randall thought Sally dead. The fire in the cabin had spread throughout the house, including the roof, and it was on the verge of collapse. Calvin proposed to run toward a corn crib to draw fire and to find cover so that Randall could run in the opposite direction. Calvin was shot through the head while he ran, but Randall got away. When they realized Randall had escaped, the nine men retreated and made their way back toward the tug. It is said that they could see the glow of the burning cabin in the night and hear the cries of the McCoy sisters. Gillespie had lost his horse, so he rode double behind Cottontop. Mounts is supposed to have said, well, we made a bad job of it. There will be trouble over this. A recent report by the Kentucky Archaeological Survey seems to confirm the general outlines of the events. It notes that bullets were found on the opposite hillsides during filming of the National Geographic reality show, Diggers, indicating return fire from the cabin. This excavation also turned up other artifacts consistent with this story, including charred wood indicative of a fire of this type. It is said that, once alerted, Randall's neighbors came to his aid. Preacher Ants Hatfield, Devil Ants' cousin, said words over the graves of Alifair and Calvin. Randall left for Pikeville in a wagon with Sally and the children. They soon moved into a home that is still standing today at the corner of Main Street and Scott Avenue. And when they passed, they were buried at Dill Cemetery, which was just across the river from the other end of Main Street. Of the men involved that night, only Mounts was executed, likely because he had confessed to murdering the only unarmed woman killed during the feud. A week after the raid, Jim Vance was injured in a skirmish and was then killed by Frank Phillips in cold blood. Tom Chambers was captured, but the evidence against him was lacking, so he was released with outstanding trial. Charles Gillespie escaped from the Pike County Jail and was never recaptured. Johnsy Hatfield fled to the northern Pacific coast after several years of being chased by bounty hunters. Ten years after the raid, he thought it was safe to return home. He was wrong. He was captured, tried in Floyd County, and given a life sentence. However, he saved a prison employee from a knife attack six years later and was pardoned and released. Thank you for watching Pikeville History Moments. 
If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit like and subscribe or click on the link to our website at visitpikeville.com. Look in the description for links to purchase some of the books we've used in our research. If you're in the area, be sure to visit some of the feud related sites or come by and see many of the feud artifacts on display at the Big Sandy Heritage Center Museum in downtown Pikeville.